It's wide open in betting terms. We've had three separate favourites. Ondarty was the favourite at first, then he was replaced by McEwen, and then he was in turn replaced by Unsworth. We've ended up with Ondarty's 6-4 favourite, Black Dogs 2-1 and Unsworth 3-1, the rest nowhere. The two books I like best on the list are the two most poetic novels, and they are Michelle Roberts and Michael Ondarchis, and I am deeply torn between the two, and I think if I was a judge, I would be too. Uh, I was surprised at how low the standard was. It's the first time that I've read all six shortlisted novels, and uh, I wouldn't have given a prize to most of them, although I think there are one or two seriously good books on the list. I think Barry Unsworth should win. It's a strong, epic adventure, which I like very much, but I think that Michael Ondarchis' book the English patient will be there too. It's a pity that certain novelists weren't on it, in my view. I think uh, P.G. James's novel should have been on it. Paul Watkins' novel, I certainly enjoyed. It was a good novel. And also J.L. Carr, which is the most uh, startling omission. The, the fallacy of the Booker Prize is that you can come up with six good books every year. And the moment you come up with a short list, and you look at the short list, and you go out and you buy the books, and you, you read them and you go, what? These are meant to be the good books? The Barry Unsworth book, The Sacred Hunger, is, is one of the best, frankly, one of the best novels I've read in the last ten years. I think it's absolutely tremendous. A great, big, serious, important novel. A novel that's going to be around for 50, 100 years. <coughs> coverage of the 1992 Booker Prize for Fiction, coming to you as ever live from Guildhall in London. We opened with some comments and predictions from guests arriving for tonight's dinner, which is now at the coffee stage. In just under 50 minutes, Victoria Glendinning, the chair of the judges, will announce the winner of certainly the most prestigious, though in fact not the most lucrative, of the literary prizes. The winner receives £20,000 and a promise of a huge boost in sales. The prize money, incidentally, is due to rise by £5,000 next year. Before the winners announce, we'll be talking to each of the six shortlisted authors about their books and hearing from our own panel of judges. Sarah Dunant is with them in the Late Show studio. Thank you, Tracy. Good evening. This is the Booker's 24th year, and as Booker's go, it's been a remarkably peaceful one. Unlike last year, when one of the judges resigned, complaining that none of the books were about ideas, this year's jury is still in place. Their shortlist reflects what, to a large extent, seems to be the preoccupation of the modern novel, history. According to the judges, two-thirds of the original 110 entries were set outside of the present. And in their shortlist, five out of the six books are in some way or other historical, while four of them deal with the legacy of the Second World War which is something we will no doubt be discussing here in the studio when we deliver our own verdict on the books with a panel which includes previous Booker Prize winner Antonia Byatt. First, back to the Guildhall and this year's contestants. Here at the awards dinner is the usual gathering of the great and the good from the worlds of publishing, business and politics. They're currently digesting their lamb on croute and awaiting the verdict. Among them, former Booker Prize judge, the writer P.D. James, who's sitting at a table with one of this year's judges, the journalist Mark Lawson and Sir Peter Parker. The newspaper magnate, Conrad Black, is sitting with his wife, the columnist Barbara O'Meal. Also, John Gummer MP, the Minister for Agriculture, and one of the judges, Valentine Cunningham, who's a lecturer in English at Oxford. Glenys and Neil Kinnock are putting in their regular appearance. And last year's winner, Ben Ocrius, here, sitting at a table with another of this year's judges, John Coldstream, who's the literary editor of the Daily Telegraph. Sitting among them are the six shortlisted authors. In less than an hour, one of them will be richer by £20,000. Christopher Hope is South African and lives in London. His second novel, Kruger's Alp, won the Whitbread Prize in 1985. This year's novel is his fifth and is called Serenity House, and the bookmakers have him at seven to one. Patrick McCabe is the youngest of the authors at 37. He teaches English in London when he's not writing. The Butcher Boy is his third novel, as well as being, and as well as being up for the Booker, it has also won the Irish Times at Aer Lingus Prize. He's also at seven to one. Michelle Roberts is the only woman on this year's shortlist, a small improvement on last year when there were no women at all. Half English, half French, she's currently the writer-in-residence at Essex University. Daughters of the House is her sixth novel and is the rank outsider at 12 to 1. Ian McEwan is British. He was previously shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1981 for his novel The Comfort of Strangers. 
This year, his Black Dogs is the bookie's second choice at 2 to 1. Barry Unsworth was brought up on Teesside, the son of a miner, and has recently moved from Helsinki to Italy. He's been shortlisted once before for Pascali's Island in 1981, when he was also up against Ian McEwan. His most recent novel, Sacred Hunger, is the heaviest book on the shortlist at 630 pages, but his odds are a sprightly 3 to 1. Michael Ondaatje was born in Sri Lanka, was educated in London, but now lives in Toronto. The English Patient is in Ondaatje's third novel and is the front runner at six to four. Those are the six shortlisted authors. One of them was secretly chosen as the winner this afternoon by the judges who change each year. This year, the chair of the judges is the writer Victoria Glendinning, whose biography of Trollope was published last month. She's sitting at the top table with the chairman of Booker, Sir Michael Caine, and his wife, the Conservative MP, Emma Nicholson. In just a short while, we'll find out what they decided and who this year's winner is. But first, back to Sarah in the studio. Thank you, Tracy. Well, the book of judges, of course, have already made their minds up. Our panel is just about to begin. With me are Tom Paulin, the poet and critic, John Walsh, the literary editor for the Sunday Times, and the writer and critic Antonia Byatt, who won the Booker two years ago for her novel Possession. Unlike this afternoon's judges, we have a strictly limited amount of time to make our choice. As an introduction to each of the books, The Late Show has talked to the authors. The first two titles up for discussion are Ian McEwan's Black Dogs and Patrick McCabe's The Butcher Boy. Ian McEwan's Black Dogs is set both in contemporary Europe and post-war France. Using the image of two wild dogs as a symbol of evil, the book articulates a battle of ideas between June, who renounces communism for a more spiritual view of the world, and her husband Bernard, a political idealist whose belief in progress is challenged by the horrors of the Second World War. Bernard was struck by the recently concluded war, not as a historical geopolitical fact, but as a multiplicity a near infinity of private sorrows, as a boundless grief minutely subdivided without diminishment among individuals who covered the continent like dust, like spores, whose separate identities would remain unknown and whose totality showed more sadness than anyone could ever begin to comprehend. For the first time, he sensed the scale of the catastrophe in terms of feeling, all those unique and solitary deaths, all that consequent sorrow, unique and solitary too, which had no place in conferences, headlines, history, and which had quietly retired to houses, kitchens, unshared beds and anguished memories. This came upon Bernard by a pine tree in the Languedoc in 1946, not as an observation he could share with June, but as a deep apprehension, a recognition of a truth that dismayed him into silence and later a question. What possible good could come of a Europe covered in this dust, these spores, when forgetting would be inhuman and dangerous, and remembering a constant torture. I think that the fascination with the wars extends beyond, you know, um, all other considerations in, 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 into a, 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 an attempt to understand evil and what and what we really are. I mean, um, yes, the novel is very much shaped by a sense that we don't have. Um, powerful, um, benevolent ideas to guide us towards the end of the century, towards the end of the millennium, uh, apart from some rather self-interested notions of, of, of a free market. We're not guided by any strong, powerful belief in either science or religion, I think, in Europe. And it's out of that agnosticism, I think, that the novel has really grew. Set in a small Irish town in the early 60s, Patrick McCabe's The Butcher Boy is a chilling tale told through the voice of the adolescent Francie Brady as he describes the events that pulled him into a spiral of madness and murder. The boy's breakdown begins through his obsession with a neighbouring family whose house he breaks into. There I was sitting in the empty house. I said, Are you talking to me, Mr Pig? When he didn't answer, I said, Did you not hear me, Philip Pig? Hmm? Or maybe you didn't know you were a pig. Is that it? Well then, I'll have to teach you. I'll make sure you won't forget again in a hurry. You too, Mrs. Nugent. Come on now. Come on now, come on now, and none of your nonsense. That was a good laugh. I said it just like the master of the school. Right today, we're going to do pigs. I want you all to stick out your faces and scrunch up your noses just like snouts. 
That's very good, Philip. I found a lipstick in one of the drawers and I wrote in big letters across the wallpaper, Philip is a pig. Now, I said, isn't that good? Yes, Francie, said Philip. And now you, Mrs. Nugent. I don't think you're putting enough effort into it. Down you get now and no slacking. So Mrs. Nugent got down and she looked every inch the best pig in the farmyard with the pink rump cocked in the air. Mrs. Nugent, I said, that is absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Francie, said Mrs. Nugent. So that was the pig school. The feeling I had with this book was a feeling of loss, a feeling of yearning, some kind of gnawing pain that could not find its focus. And because it could not find its focus, there was an anger there as well. And um, the sense of the disappointment with the world and a magical childhood idealism that cannot accept imperfection. And because things are, are fixed in some way that they can never come out properly, the anger begins to take over from the idealism. Well, let's start with Ian McEwan's Black Dogs, a book which is basically an examination of evil and the political and idealistic failures of post-war Europe. Tom Paulin, did you like it? I was absolutely fascinated by it, I mean, in terms of the very few English novels which actually take on the problem of evil. So Ian Foster said he didn't believe in evil. This is an unrelentingly serious attempt to actually find a theological structure uh, for discussing evil and to relate it to the collapse of communism and what's, what's happening in, in Europe. It's got certain faults. I think the, the prose style is too lucidly rational. He actually, McEwan, doesn't really believe in evil, but he wants to as a way of explaining uh, what's, uh, what's happened to communism and to progressive ideas. So he takes certain kind of Doris Lessing characters and exposes them to the breakdown of their rational optimism. And I think that makes it very, very interesting. Well, it's, it's clearly a, a big book in terms of its ideas. It's actually a very short book in terms of its length. How does one compress into the other, John Walsh? Well, exactly. The, the structure is absolutely baffling in this novel. You start off with a charming prologue, uh, which is terribly McEwen, about, um, about a chap who doesn't like going around doing things that young people do in the 60s. He likes hanging out with his parents, friends. And there's a whole setup of uh, the sexy sister and the boyfriend. All this is suddenly thrown away, and we start a new story. There are two 35-page conversations with the two protagonists, Bernard and June, the good communists and the bad communists. And, so, and it ends in this sort of three, I think, bullets, like three vignettes of horror. Uh, the concentration camp, the, uh, the family violence in a restaurant, <clears throat> and the image of the black dogs. And it's as if, having set up this series of little coordinates, he's expecting some electricity to jump between them, and he's leaving rather too much for the reader to do, to synthesise them. And I think that its failure. All right, so we've got a big book from Tom and 35-page conversations from John. Antonia? I'm slightly more on John's side. I think it's an extraordinarily elegant book, in fact. I think there's a very powerful structural force, <coughs> and it goes in little circles between conversation and violence and conversation and violence. And I love the way it does the tension between contemplation and the belief in utopia. The woman decides that religious contemplation is the only thing, and the man is still trying to improve the world. That said, I think that the central symbol, the evil dogs which try to kill the woman and have to carry the whole weight of being the Second World War, doesn't quite work. Ian McEwan is such a good writer that it almost works, but in the end I thought, no, no, this is a short story that has been blown up a little bit. He's a wonderful writer. And it's a short story, and yet, as Tom said, it's got huge ideas in it. There's a tension well, there. Yeah, but I think Antonio's, uh, Antonio's right. The uh, black dog idea, Churchill's idea, which is mm. quoted of, of melancholy. Well, in fact, the Churchill, who wasn't religious at all, didn't believe in evil, and this was his idea, uh, his symbol for depression. You can't put the two together, but I think McEwen's doing that because there's a whole English, French, German thing at, at work in, in this novel, because like so many of these novels, it is a Euro novel, and it's trying to address the way things feel at the moment. All right, well, it's clearly a very serious novel, and from the odds, it's a very serious contender. Let's move on to Patrick McCabe's The Butcher Boy, which is one of the few novels that is not about the Second World War, about history. <coughs> this is this breakdown of a young boy. Um, John Walsh, there's always an Irish writer on the Booker Prize list, <laughs> almost always, but very seldom do they win. Is this one in with a chance? The unexpected Irishman. Well, is this Irish psycho? Is this some, some Gaelic version of Brett Easton Ellis? Um, 
It's, I think it's, too, it's, it's a novel on too small a scale to win. As, as we discuss things, it will become obvious what's the one with the real scale and scope. But the thing about this book, The Butcher Boy, is is there more to it than just the simple ventriloquial trick? This slightly crazed, um, slightly rather funny voice which goes around haranguing, full of confidence and breeziness, and uh, is always rushing about and is full of this genial humour when he's on this downward slide towards complete madness. There have been many fictions in the past which have had uh, sort of dodgy teenagers, upsetting middle-class um, complacency. I mean, The Children of Dinmouth by William Trevor, I suppose, the best one. But the thing is, McCabe's imagination is what really transforms this book and makes it more than ventriloquism. He is so peculiar. His obsession with pigs and goldfish and comic strip villains and his obsession with the, what you might call the malign cliché. Nobody uses clichés like he does. And every time they say, ah, now, Francie, and you be the man for that, Francie, you feel exactly these are people trying to push this awful person away. It's like a huge face right up against I must face. admit, I found it a tour de force, actually, mm. of, 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 of an imaginative voice breaking down as even the language that he uses breaks down. It's a very painful book, as well as a funny one to read, Antonio. Yes, I had no wish to read it. I read the first chapter, and then I'm afraid I looked at the last chapter, and I thought, I do not wish to read a book about somebody who murders somebody with a humane killer for pigs. I just don't want to read it. And then I read it. It is brilliantly written. The pace is perfect. There is not any place where you don't sympathise with this poor, tormented child. I have read hundreds of books about poor, tormented children, and I have read hundreds of books from a slanted narrative point of view where you have to guess what's happening because he doesn't always tell you. And in a sense, this book is ordinary, but Patrick McCabe's writing is so skilful, and the pain of this poor child who's lost his best friend to another ordinary little boy because he can't grow up oh. and the other boy does. Uh, it made me very unhappy. I shall never read it again. Tom? Well, it, it's, uh, it's wonderfully written. It's got this great skittery, living voice to it. You know, you've got, got the sort of vernacular speech of the community. Marvellous. But it gets lost. It becomes parochial. It recycles the, the, the usual things uh, about Daniel O'Connell and Matt Talbot, this uh, religious maniac in Dublin who wrapped himself in chains. It, it, it gets piously confused. It wants to take on the violence in the culture, the misogyny, the patriarchal values, the whole opus day uh, hi hierarchy, uh, Catholic hierarchy that's running the Irish re Republic, but it can't do it because it's lost in a kind of parochial parody. But wonderful style, brilliantly written, extraordinary style, and I wish that McEwan's had broken away towards that kind of vernacular. It's, it's a terrific... Uh, uh, the novel in the way it begins. The way you've described this is a kind of like a, a like a vindication of it that all these yeah. things are in there. He broadens it out from this one chap who is going crackers yeah. until right at the end you have this apocalypse where the town is waiting uh, for the Virgin Mary and is burning just as he's burning his own house down. Yeah, and it's, it's outrageous. It all right, I'm going to have to stop you there because otherwise the other four <coughs> books will feel that we didn't treat them fairly. It's time for us to move on now to the next two books on the shortlist, which are. Christopher Hope's Serenity House and Michelle Roberts' Daughters of the House. Serenity House by Christopher Hope is a black comedy about the geriatric Max Mountfalcon who lives in a nursing home in London. What is gradually revealed is that Max is a former Nazi and his exposure leads the book into an exploration of some dark parallels between society's treatment of old people, Nazi concentration camps and even Disney theme parks. A number of people have um, suggested that the novel is about the Holocaust. It isn't. The Holocaust is there as a dark um, resonance behind it, but in fact it's about England now. It's about England as a kind of theme park, a theme park with poll tax riots. It's about America and the natural exuberance Americans have for killing each other, uh, a talent unequaled, I think, in the century. And it is also, I suppose, about uh, the awkwardness in remembering that which you do not wish to remember, something which all old people, I think, to some degree suffer from, and perhaps ex-Nazis, and my Max Montfalcon is indeed a rather curious ex-Nazi, suffers from most of all. But what Max wants, in a sense, is both to remember and to forget where he comes from. What he gets in the end is a journey to, um, to America as a kind of paradise, which turns in, into a sort of theme park, I suppose, rather deathly theme park. And that is, is in a sense, for Max, um, both um, scary and yet appropriate. One was free to arrive individually, by car, coach, or even on foot flagged into place by peach-shirted perimeter guards, leaving one's vehicle in the spacious parking areas, each designated by a large friendly animal or cunning dwarf. The same unobtrusive steely discipline required to keep large numbers of people moving was very much in evidence to anyone who knew the signs. No eating, smoking, drinking, please remain seated at all times. 
excellent. Control of numbers, obedience at all times. It seemed one remembered similar soothing deceptions in other facilities long ago. Daughters of the House by Michelle Roberts is an evocative tale of childhood, religion, secrecy and betrayal set in provincial post-war France. The novel traces the relationship in childhood and later as adults between two girl cousins, one English, one French. One of the things I was trying to do was to explore whether little girls make good historians or not, because it's not normally a role you associate with them. In this case, the two little girls are finding out whether the village secrets to do with people dying in wartime and being murdered in wartime are in any way involved with the family secrets, which are to do with seductions and sex and children being born uh, on what was called the wrong side of the blanket, perhaps, or not. And because little girls are insatiably curious, sexually, morally and politically, in a rather well, in an amoral way, perhaps, my two make really good detectives. And what they do is unearth all kinds of information that the adults really would rather got forgotten about. The cellar door was in one corner of the kitchen, near the window on the outside wall. Its paint glistened black. It was kept locked and entry to it forbidden to the children, as Lenny knew perfectly well. She had never been bothered by the prohibition. There were so many other intriguing sites for play. Now, she thought, how mean grown-ups are. I'm going to see what it's like in there. The black iron key turned easily in the lock. The door swung open inwards. She hesitated, then crept down. The stone coolness below the house smelled of soil. She stood on a floor of trodden earth. The single light bulb dangling on its long black cord showed her rows of iron racks. The heels of wine bottles were cold green moons she stroked as she slid past. A tall barrel had split its sides, gaped. She stopped when something soft and fluttery brushed her face. She was deeper than the house, level with worms, all the dead things that were put into the ground. Had that been a spider's web that touched her cheek just now? Perhaps it was time to go back upstairs. Well, we come first to the Christopher Hope Serenity House. It's rather a bleak comedy, a combining kind of geriatric care and old Nazis. Antonia. I loved it. It's, um, <laughs> it gets better and better the more you think about it. It, it's, it has a completely original, grotesque, horrible comedy, which is not the kind of thing I normally like. It uses things like the fairy story of Jack the Giant Killer. In its American bland version, the, the horrible Jack worked in a Disneyland and wore a Mickey Mouse head with, inside which he tried to strangle people. Um, it deals in a rumbustiously awful way with the horrors of growing old in an old people's home. It's like Christopher Hope describes his own South Africa, or like he described Russia, which he felt was like South Africa. It's full of huge lies and a kind of phantasmagoric improbability, which is, in fact, the real world. As he said, our, our world is like a grotesque theme park. I think it's a very original book. Gosh, I don't think I was reading the same book as you, but uh, Tom Paulin. Dreadful, galumphing, tedious, oh. hopeless, boring novel. It's rubbish. Absolutely dreadful. Oh, come on, oh. let's have a bit more analysis than that. No, well, there's nothing to say, say about it. It's, 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 it's complete nonsense. It's not funny. It's, it's nauseatingly boring. Uh, it's dreadful. I can well, say no more about it. John? <clears throat> I'm occupying some middle ground here. I was, uh. <laughs> I was talking to one of the judges at lunchtime today. He said, I'm, I didn't really want this one to win because it's full of what you might call designer ironies that are just morally unacceptable. I rather like that phrase, I must it's say. It's a bit like <coughs> Lee Amos crossed with Martin Amos, isn't it? Yeah, I guess Only it's a lot worse. It's, worse. it's morally if I, if unacceptable because it's about a thing that's morally unacceptable. It's morally... It's, it's not even. I don't find it that. I think it's, I think it's extremely clever. And my, my only problem with this book is that I think it's... it's Extremely sophisticated, Clever. intelligent. Yes, yeah, sure. Why? Constant. The, the, the last chapter, uh, aligning Disneyland to a concentration camp, is a, a work of sustained genius. I think on a level with a Julian Barnes on uh, on the woodworm and Noah's Ark. Wonderfully well. The way you actually take a luggage ossuary, um, the hill of bones in a concentration camp, and you align it to the the mountain of suitcases in this home, which of course will never be taken out of. Did there. you not Those find it details. rather artificial, though? I could see it working as a literary concept. Well, Somebody would put these bricks together, but it's, it's artificiality. It's again, an artificial it? form. You have to say some of these things in an artificial form. It's a fable. It's like Voltaire's Candide. It's a kind of huge comic fable. Um, it, there are certain things you, some people can only say in that kind of way, and I found this 
much more appalling than Ian McEwan because I felt there was something centrally slightly sentimental about the way McEwan took on evil, whereas Christopher Hope runs at it thunk, and, right. and I prefer that. A final last word, Tom. Well, I mean, evil's not, not, not a concept in, in, in comedy, but I mean, it dignifies this dreadful novel to call it uh, a comedy. It's nothing at all. It's, it's come out of some computer or other. It's, it's plastic. It's ersatz. Oh, oh, it's all nothing. right, well, let's leave that there and move on to Michelle Roberts's Daughters of the House. Um, this is a very small scale novel, in a sense, deliberately. It's set in a, in a family in a provincial post war France. Um, I think nonetheless intense for that. Tom, did you feel better about this book? Yeah, I, I, I began it and, and, and really loved it. Wonderful singing, confident, inte creative intelligence to it. Marvellous. Then I thought it got a bit foody, it got a bit home and gardens, slightly sort of French, Laura Ashley quality to it. And then I thought, no, but there, 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 there's something uh, really fine about, about, about this imagination. I, I, I enjoyed it. And then uh, I began to think it's, it's a bit like a sort of woodcut. There's something static about it. You get the wretched house um, uh, photographed again and again throughout the, the novel. It, it, it's, there's something static about it, but it, it begins terrifically well. It's, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's quite good, really. Think. John, John I think one of the main thing you take away from this novel is, uh, is texture. It's just so full of these wonderful descriptions of reeking, um, reekings of smells and sights and, and descriptions of plates and napery and flesh and bodily functions, indeed. It's done with this extremely simple limpidity that I find very suspect, frankly. It's like Janet and John visit tables the, and chairs, Janet maybe? and John visit the lavatory. Janet and John play doctors and patients. Um, yeah. but, but, but it then, halfway through, changes tack and suddenly you get this new, this sudden access of spirituality, which seems to be counterpointing this this monstrous uh, sort of hedonism and in the middle of it is this is this wandering around the secrets of the war which frankly I thought were rather rather pointless I yeah. didn't, actually I didn't give a damn whether who had who had done what to whom and what it meant about their parentage it was as if Claude Chabrol had in a sudden fit of madness decided to direct the the Fortnum's catalogue all right well, well listen yeah. I'm going to bring mm. Antonio very quickly I'll just say reading it as a woman I think exactly the things that you criticize Tom which is this this detail that it brings to life of the domestic nay the feminine the furniture the pots and pans the cooking the food is wonderful mm -hmm. that she has a Quite. poet's eye that elevates that kind of detail and yeah. imbues yeah. it with real importance and sensuality yeah. Antonio the thing it reminds me of is Velasquez painting of um, Christ in the house of Mary and Martha, these two women. One of them is an ersatz saint who sees a completely saccharine Virgin Mary with blonde hair and little pink cheeks and pearls. And the other one sees a real goddess, a sort of bright red shining goddess in red clothes, like a flame. And isn't believed when she tells about it. And it's the one who sees the bright red goddess who is the housekeeping one who takes on the Martha qualities. And the Mary one goes and becomes a sort of sterile nun in a convent. We haven't said anything about the plot. The house we're talking about is the common memories of both of them. And it's static in the way one's childhood is static. Yes, but in at the same time, the house is a room where Jews were imprisoned during the war and were taken off and murdered. And but still, it's the house, the, sa the sacred place, the, the, the kitchen, and it's relating the foodiness of it to the actual um, historical obscenity well, she's well, facing in French anti-Semitism. Are we talking that about worries something me. which is exactly the point that, that yes. it had in the Ian McEwan extract that we heard earlier, which is that the war, in a sense, is about a lot of little, tiny, disparate separate secrets and tragedies and sorrows that, that took place and this house mm. contains one of them and it seems to me maybe this is a good time to talk about that larger theme all mm. of the people on this shortlist who've been writing about the war are in their 40s they're the same generation they're writing about something they had no part of themselves and suddenly now they're all writers have been writing for a while they need to make sense of it what is that john walsh well i it's only a theory but i think it's it's a very 90s thing it's uh, as we approach the end of the century rather than the millennium it's a matter of binding up the century somehow and looking at it and there in the middle is this huge great black monolith that you can you that still kind of pulls things towards it like a black hole I might also point out that three of the novels three of the six novels here feature manifestations of the divine of some divine notion the butcher's boy ends with it Michelle Roberts has two uh, virgins suddenly appearing or divine apparitions and of course McEwen when, when his heroine sees mm. the black dogs also gets some notion of a uh, kind of some mm. spiritual Alignment come in, yeah. adjusting her life. Yeah, uh, the, uh, the Angel of Mons would be a, a good, uh, a good d double act right. for next year. Antonio, as a writer, do you feel that at all, a pull upon you? Well, 
what I would say is that the novel has always been historical. Look at Tolstoy, look at Dickens, look at George Eliot, look at Thackeray. People are always writing about the generation before they themselves were alive. This is actually nothing new. I think people are trying to make sense of the war. And I think when you remember Tom Paulin's comments on the Ian McEwan, there is a terrible wish that there should be something spiritual in our lives. Mm. And nobody who is looking for it really seems to be able other than to say it isn't there. Oh. And that includes Christopher Hope as well, who was also a Catholic. Right. OK, well, now let's move on to the final two books on the shortlist this year. And they are Michael on Darches, The English Patient, and Barry Unsworth's Sacred Hunger. The English Patient by Michael on Darche is set in a bombed-out villa in northern Italy at the end of the Second World War. Four displaced characters, a Canadian nurse, a thief, a bomb disposal expert and a badly burned pilot, try to overcome the trauma of memory. At the centre of the narrative is the enigmatic presence of the scarred airmen. I fell burning into the desert. They found my body and made me a boat of sticks and dragged me across the desert. We were in the sand sea, now and then crossing dry riverbeds. Nomads, you see. Bedouin. I flew down and the sand itself caught fire. They strapped me onto a cradle, a carcass boat, and feet thudded along as they ran with me. I had broken the spareness of the desert. The Bedouin knew about fire. They knew about planes that since 1939 had been falling out of the sky. Some of their tools and utensils were made from the metal of crashed planes and tanks. It was the time of the war in heaven. I was perhaps the first one to stand up alive out of a burning machine. A man whose head was on fire. They didn't know my name. I didn't know their tribe. Who are you? I don't know. You keep asking me. You said you were English. I think everyone in that book and everyone at that time seems to have left their home behind. Everyone seems to have come from a place that they don't want to go back to, that they can't go back to yet. They're all, in a way, curing their wounds. And especially the patient is someone who hates his past or doesn't, does, does not like it. He hates even referring to where he comes from for political reasons, but also, I think, for more personal reasons. Um, the international bastard, the, the person who is from one country who lives in another country and has to deal with that problem. Um, is a very central one to our time. You know, I think that's our main story in our, our time. And uh, I think that's what's happening in this book to these characters. In a way, it's sort of, um, although it's set in 1945, it projects itself into our time. Sacred Hunger by Barry Unsworth is a historical epic set against the 18th century slave trade. The book moves between England and life on a slave ship showing how the sacred hunger for money fueled a trade based almost entirely on man's inhumanity to man. There was little more than two feet of headroom, and the boards they lay on were of unplaned plank, so that as they rolled helplessly in the hot, suffocating darkness, the rough surface of the wood took the skin from their backs and sides. Deaths among the Negroes during the six days of bad weather had amounted to 18, 10 men, five women, and three boys. The ship had been blown considerably off course, and a good number more were likely to die before Jamaica was reached. Those that survived would not look attractive to the planters that came to bid for them. Cargo dying aboard ship of so-called natural causes was quite worthless, whereas cargo cast overboard for good and sufficient reason could be classed as lawful jetsam. It's an adventure story at one level. It narrates the journey of a particular slave ship, the voyage of, of a slave ship from Liverpool, where it's built, to West Africa, to the, to the Caribbean. A typical slave trading venture of the time. Um, and uh, what happens to the ship, or what happens to the men aboard the ship, what happens to the slaves that are taken in Africa, is part of the story of action that the book has. It also to my mind, as I wrote, it symbolized the entrepreneurial spirit about which we hear a great deal, or have heard a great deal uh, lately. Um, and uh, as I wrote the book, the, the two things really were closely interwoven in my mind. 
All right, let's first consider Michael and Darcy's The English Patient. Now, this is the favourite, this rather strange poetic tale set in post-war Italy. John, is it your favourite? Well, I've had a great time lately reading the reviews. Uh, the critics have suggested it's the finest novel in the last few years. It's a kind of sacred text that will live forever. Well, OK, every reader is his blind spot, or two or three, and mine is Michael Ondaatje. I cannot see what all the fuss is about. I'm completely blind to its, its virtues. I found this novel by turns irritating, soporific, contrived, repetitive, and willfully opaque. <coughs> now, I appreciate the power of this, this initial fresco that's set up. This, uh, this, this house in the middle of a minefield as a kind of the debris of war, in the middle of which is this trio of characters grouped around this uh, inert figure. I also appreciate this kind of colonial soup we're being handed here, a white man who's burned into a, being a black man, an Englishman who isn't actually an Englishman underneath it all, uh, an English bomb disposal sapper who's actually called Kerpal Singh, whose name contracts out a Kip, as in Kipling. Um, 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 who's the other one? The, um, oh, the Canadian thief, who's called Caravaggio, who's given the name of a late Renaissance master of light. And all this slightly phonus baloness stuff about light and shade, which is nudged at you until your ribs are sore all the way through this book. Do you realise, Sarah, that for the first 120 pages, the words dark or darkness or black or blackness turn up on every single page? All right, well, I cannot believe how boring and monotonous and I certainly it didn't realise that. What I will say about this book, and it's much more a feeling than an, an intellectual analysis, is that it haunted me after I put it down. The atmosphere, the sense of time and place stayed with me for a very long time afterwards. Antonia? I thought it was an extraordinarily good book. It's a poet's novel, and the novelist in me gets slightly irritated by it because something is wrong with the narrative tension. But the placing of the parts of it, I'm, I'm a patient reader, the placing of the imagination of the Sikh against the imagination of Caravaggio the thief, against the Hannah the nurse who has lost her baby and has nursed people. The little moments of dying soldiers and how she deals with them practically. The wonderful descriptions of taking bombs to pieces. I love the they way he holds them all yeah. in each yeah. in the book yeah. together. Yeah. And I mean John calls it Furnace Below, and <coughs> I found it very poetic. But something that a novel normally has is not there. Tom. Well, I, I agree with John. I mean, it, 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 is, it is a weightless kind of pro, prose poem. It's the longest prose poem I've ever read. And I, I was uh, reading Well, you're a good it. judge of prose poems. They can be very good prose poems. Oh, there can. Poems. It's a difficult form. But I, I was, I was rereading it yesterday, and I came across this sentence. She sniffs the stone, the cool moth smell of it. Oh, that's terrific. Perfect iambic pentameter. The thing about prose is it has to get rid of the iambic pentameter. It cannot fall into that reflex tumpty tumness that the pentameter uh, uh, ca can badly used create. And that's the problem with it. It's, it's weightless, it's luxurious, it's got an empty uh, sensuousness All right. about it. Okay, we're going to have to stop there. The book he's favourite is clearly not ours. We do need to get on to Barry Unsworth or we will n not be able to talk about him at all. A big book here about the slave trade, the biggest book on the list. Is it big in more than size, Antonia? Um, it's a well-made novel. I don't agree with Penelope Lively that it's a major novel. I think if it were to win, it's the one that the readers would get the most of, the general reader would get the most from if they all went out and bought it. And if it doesn't win, I hope they do all go out and buy it. Because it's a, it's a lovely read. It is a moral book, which is quite complicated, but not quite complicated enough. It's designs on the entrepreneurial spirit. I think are a bit too obvious. It, yeah. He has tried to make us imagine the entrepreneurial spirit from inside because he's a just man, and he has almost done it. But in the time when P.D. James has said our only religion is anti-racism, he is in a sense pandering mm. towards something around that is very easy, which is a pity because it is a good book. Tom Paul. Uh, it's a very worthy, decent sort of repro maritime historical novel. Uh, it's hearts in the right place. Uh, he's read Melville. He's read Golding. He's read Conrad. Um, I, I, I can't take it seriously. Why not? Well, it's just. I mean, it's 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 a very very old fashioned, um, boring old historical novel. I mean, that's that's all it is. 
Well, I have to say, to a certain extent, I, I agree with you in one particular way, that I felt that all the characters were really kind of mouthpieces of philosophical attitudes of their time, rather. You know, even down to the captain of the ship who was seen as the incarnation of the prophet motive, and that's a quote neatly tying him to the contemporary. Um, and I was rather worried that because he didn't really get under the skin of the slaves in terms of making them lively as characters, whether all of that violence, and the book is very violent, wasn't in some way slightly gratuitous. That was sort of... My reaction, John. Yes. Well, I'm, if, the, if we were sitting here in the 18th century, one would say this is a book with bottom. Um, with, with the proper bottom, yes. With, with, <laughs> yes. Say, with, like this book of high seriousness and, and decency, and um, it has this ballast and, and amplitude of, indeed, indeed, a large ship. And it's, it's, very, it's as Tom sneers at it rather, and I'm tempted to go along with it, because, well, at the beginning, let me say this, at the beginning, I was intensely suspicious. This is Hornblower trying to be golding. Yeah, this, this, is, this, is, this, this is George yeah. MacDonald Fraser pretending yeah, he's Conrad. Yeah, yeah. That's this, right. this is, oh yes, this one. Let me, uh, at the beginning, one wonders at these conversations in which Captain Thurso, this, this uh, scumbag who's clearly Captain Bly in another, another frog coat, says things like, uh, I don't trust this ship with a narrow bottom. <laughs> and another sailor says, ah, oh, nor a witch, neither a captain. <laughs> right, so that great. was your beginning. That, How well, did yes, you end? Branch, yeah. I think just as you go on, I mean, 600 pages, it's fantastic. As the thing gets underway in creeks and this fantastic seafaring law is thrown at you, you never actually understand a word of it, but gradually this whole great canvas unfurls, this great sail, until you ignore the threadbareness of the material and the iffiness of the stitching, and it actually really starts to, to rise. I found it rather moving. I found it right. really rather, rather... And a rather a, a, a guilty pleasure by the end. A it. guilty and pleasure. It's, it's it's a good, perhaps a very nice description of a book. Of book. I'm going to stop you now because I know they're about to announce the winner. You have uh, a few words that you can say to me. Tom, which book is going to win? I'm wondering whether the Ons Worth might win. I mean, I, ho I hope the Michelle Roberts and Ian McEwan get it jointly, but I'm wondering All right, whether yes, John, briefly, when, a book. When the day comes the Butcher Boy could win, I'd wish, I wish it would, but Unsworth will win, I'm sure. Right, Antonia Byatt. Um, hope for Andarchi, I would like to win. Right, the English Patient or Serenity, Serenity House. That is the point where I now hand over to Guildhall and Tracy. Thanks, Sarah. We're about to learn who the winner is. The chairman of Booker, Sir Michael Caine, will now invite Victoria Glendinning to announce the judge's decision. It is now that I have enormous pleasure to say that the Chairman of the Judges, uh, Victoria Glenn Denning, is going to move to the lectern and will be able to give the decision of the judges on the Booker Prize of 1992. I should first like to thank Sir Michael Caine and Booker PLC for hosting this generous extravaganza and for continuing to support New Fiction and the Book Trust for administering the prize so efficiently. I'd also like to pay tribute to Martin Goff, who runs the judges' meetings and indeed runs the judges for Booker and the Book Trust. There is a fish called Naucrates Ductor, otherwise known as the pilot fish, which swims alongside sharks, keeping an eye on them. <laughs> Mr. Goff was a discreet pilot fish, nudging the rest of us in the direction of reaching a result. The judges are not sharks, at least I don't think so, but the waters in which writers and publishers swim are shark-infested. All of us on the panel have been variously amused and infuriated by the media coverage of this year's shortlist. Amused by the terrific wrongness of most of the rumours and infuriated by the dismissive rent -a sneer comments about the shortlist. Several commentators said they were bored by the booker. This is the price paid for the booker's success. Even book lovers, like all lovers, can succumb to passion fatigue. And only a little rest and another good book can cure that. The only certainty with the Booker Prize is that someone is going to win it, like tonight, soon, in a minute. <laughs> the people who just can't win in any sense are we judges. It doesn't much matter, 
But if Booker judges choose established homegrown names for their shortlist, they are accused of playing safe and failing to identify up-and-coming writers and those from the wider English-speaking world. If they choose lesser-known writers, some of them un-English, they are accused of deliberately picking the obscure or the unreadable. What is infuriating is the assumption that anyone reads in any such schematic terms. We read each novel for itself and argued for the ones that moved or interested or amused us most. It has been remarked that five of the novels that came into this category of excellence and onto the shortlist are set at least partly in the past and four have their roots in the horrors of World War II and its sickening legacies. I don't think this reflected the judges' obsessions. I mean, you get what you get, and this is what we got. Maybe everything is so violently unstable right now that situations, and even geography, uh, I remember a phrase from Michael Ondaatje's novel, the sadness of geography. All may be exploded between the finishing of a novel and its publication. Another reason which I believe to be the truer one is that we are in this world in a moral mess, and that events in Europe at the moment are being perceived by people in the perception business, i.e. good novelists, as part of a continuing story. Western greed and inhumanity have their roots deep in the past, as Barry Unsworth's novel chronicles. And the evil released by war is only ever temporarily contained. At the end of his novel, Ian McEwan writes that the black dogs will return somewhere in Europe. And indeed, they have. A woman in Michelle Roberts's novel understood that history was voices that came alive and shouted. Voices came alive and shouted in all these novels, and in two of them, Christopher Hope's and most graphically Patrick McCabe's, there is the voice of a young psychopath made what he is by the deprivation and violence that is all he has known. As you may deduce, though there were plenty of funny bits in these novels, we didn't have much to laugh at and this we regretted. But it was a terrifically strong year. We could have produced two different but acceptable shortlists. Picking just six books was horrible. Picking the outright winner seemed a necessary nonsense because it was not, in spite of what I said, comparing like with like, but we had to try to do it. The shortlisted novels, to recap for the very last time, are Serenity House by Christopher Hope, Black Dogs by Ian McEwan, The English Patient by Michael Ondaatje, Daughters of the House by Michelle Roberts, Sacred Hunger by Barry Unsworth. The 1992 Booker Prize for Fiction is shared between Michael Ondaatje and Barry Unsworth. <laughs> To say I'm delighted would be a, a mild way of putting it in the long course of writing novels. I've been sometimes praised. Checks have been somewhat slower to follow. <laughs> I expect that strikes a, a responsive chord in some breasts here tonight. Uh, to have both the check and the praise together is something, it's a marvelous combination and I'm very, very happy about it. Thank you very much. I'm 
got only 20 seconds, apparently, so thank you, Bloomsbury and Picador and Marion Boyd, who first published me in England. And thank you to all my friends in Canada and the publishing industry there. And thank you, Linda. Thank you. So, Barry Ainsworth and Michael and Garcia are joint winners of the Booker Prize 1992, perhaps a reflection of the violent disputes that are reputed to have characterized the judging this year. It's only happened once before in 1974 when Nadine Gordimer and Stanley Middleton shared the prize. But from Guildhall, back to the studio for their reaction. And indeed, in 1974, Antonia Bart, you were one of the judges, so you must, this must have been a very tumultuous judging session, clearly. Oh, indeed it must. When we did it, there were only three judges, and after that, they put the number of judges, I think, quite properly up to five, in an attempt, I think, to prevent this ever happening again, because I think it was felt that it was better to have one winner. I'm rather happy, because I, I think both those men well deserve to have a prize, and, um, and I think it will do... No harm at all. Great. A very quick reaction, John. I think it's perfectly all right. I think that the, uh, the, the judges are perfectly decent people. I'm glad they did it this way than picking a compromise. I'm glad an awful lot of people will read two books and, uh, uh, yeah. this year. Tom, one. briefly. That's fine, yeah. <laughs> 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 OK, the English Patient and Sacred Hunger are the joint winners of this year's Booker 92. Um, it all remains for me to say goodnight and thank you to my guests, Antonia Bayer, John Walsh and Tom Paulin. And to say, don't forget, the Late Show continues its French week at 11.15 tonight. But from the Booker Prize 92 from me, goodnight. <laughs>